Frank Miller wrote The Dark Knight Returns, Batman Year One, Daredevil Born Again, and Sin City, classics of the genre. He also created All-Star Batman and Robin, The Dark Knight Strikes Again, and Holy Terror, which were absolutely terrible. If you've been following my read through and review of the Dark Knight series, then you know that the only thing consistent about the comic creator is his inconsistency. Back with a book that no one asked for, The Dark Knight 3 The Master Race, the writer has the opportunity to either save the franchise or ruin it even further. Beginning in 2015, the book has suffered from delay after delay, but with the help of Brian Azzarello and Annie Cuba, DC have guided Miller to the point that it is now released as a trade. Analyzing the book page by page, I will be discussing whether it's worth your time or if this series should finally have a good death. That's like, that's like ref, never mind. So let's dive right into Batman The Dark Knight The Master Race. The book opens in the Batcave. We hover over the destruction left in the wake of The Dark Knight Strikes Again and are told there's no such thing as a good death. Yeah, there isn't Frank, because people just can't let things die, and they have to keep bringing them back and making them worse. Nice one. Anyway, this would have been a brilliant opening had it not been ruined by the text message captions that plagued the first issue. It seems that the people of Gotham haven't discovered predictive text yet, and are still typing in that annoying way that everyone did in the early 2000s. Now, I would never slag off my childhood, but bar tattoo and endless days of masturbation, there's very little I remember from those days. Littered throughout the opening bubbles are things like I seen him and BS, nobody can beat the bat for three years. It's hard to read anything that's written so badly. It's like reading a Melania Trump speech that hasn't been written by someone else. I took a slight dislike to the opening chapter because of it. Whilst I understand this homage is the original Dark Knight Returns, even back then it was dated. When creating a sequel you should carry some things over that work and leave the relics in the past. Even with an update this makes the initial issues difficult to get into and I'm glad that someone in power intervened at some point and made Miller and Azzarello dial it back in the following chapters because it reads worse than Stephen Hawkins when his Windows is going through an update. Whilst perhaps being overly critical of the text, I'm happy to say that the art is the best that it's ever been in the entire Dark Knight series. Whilst it has about as much competition as a Mugabe election, Cubert still stands head and shoulders above the rest. His work always flashing elements of Miller now stands directly above it. He was the perfect choice for this book and carries over a lot of the aesthetics that made the designs in the originals pop. Whether handling large cityscapes or simple surroundings such as corridors and streets, Cuba captures them all perfectly. Still steeped in politics, Miller and Azzarello this time capture a lot of media coverage in a satirical sense perfectly. News anchors blur out comments unchecked and it's clear the creators have been looking for more faults in Fox News than Alex Jones. Referencing this, Wonder Woman comments on how the world regarded her kind as saviours until they had potential to become threats. It really speaks volumes to how humanity, in general, deifies public figures, then crucifies them, then resurrects them. This isn't just an allegory for Christ, it's something I've noticed that happens to people in the spotlight. How many celebrities have been put on a pedestal, stripped of it, and then repositioned back there by a new generation? Countless. Throughout the first issue, we see the police chase down the new Bat figure, getting the reveal that it is in fact Carrie Kelly in the cape and cowl. She announces that Bruce is dead, leaving a brilliant twist ending for the first issue, but also signifying the rebirth that the Cape Crusader would go through. This is the overarching theme of the Dark Knight saga, and it clearly ties into a Christ metaphor as well as a comment on society. The Bat died, was resurrected. Bruce died, was resurrected. Superman died, he returned, and this motif appears repeatedly through the books to its ending. Miller has created a universe that kills its heroes more often than not, but they return whenever needed. One of the most unique aspects of this book is the inclusion of the mini-issue. 
In the graphic novel print, they are full size and honestly work better in this format as opposed to the original. Acting as supplementary material, they focus on the universe's side characters. Missing from most is Batman, so they can either be skipped by the casual reader or analysed by the hardcore fan. Adding more of a backstory than specific plot elements, they really enrich the overall story. When taking on this book, I expected to be able to breeze through it. On my second read through though, I've come to realise that it's actually jam packed with content. Cuba has done a brilliant job of capturing Miller's style and bar a few hang ups from the series legacy, the initial chapter does a brilliant job of rekindling us within the world of The Dark Knight Returns once more. The second chapter of The Dark Knight 3 centres around the imprisonment of Carrie Kelly and her eventual escape. During interrogation at the hands of Commissioner Yindel, we learn about Bruce Wayne's demise after the beating he received from Lex Luthor in The Dark Knight Strikes Again. On first read this interrogation is an enthralling moment, however it loses all sentimentality upon the appearance of a living and breathing Bruce later in the issue. Having never actually been dead, the lie told by Kerry was only implemented as a distraction. Retrospectively, it strips away a lot of the legitimacy that this issue has, and had it not been for the subplot, the majority of book two would have been simply filler. Mirroring Carrie's imprisonment and release, we see the Atom free the citizens of the bottle city of Kandor. Upon liberation, the religious zealots, led by Qua, murder the Atom and initiate their plan to rule the world. The bottled city of Kandor was made up of shrunken Kryptonians. Stripped of their power, they must have felt persecuted for years, and now upon their release they seek revenge. Metaphorically, this works as a synonym of the Middle East. Terrorised by the West for decades, they have, as of late, fought back and suffered at the hands of our counter-attack. They are villains in the same way that the Kryptonians are, and act as the perfect modern day foe working as both a comic book enemy whilst also providing satire to the wars we fight today, they feel like a formidable antagonist. It's difficult to draw from this which side Miller is on. It would be wrong to label him as a racist, as one could argue that he provides pros and cons to both aspects, i.e. Batman parades around carelessly destroying property, enforcing his rule over the world and disobeying the law. He is labelled as a hero. However, when the freed Kandorians do it, it is seen as villainous. Similarly, America and the UK candidly invaded the Middle East, but presented it as liberation. We were labelled as the good guys because of media coverage and fear. Perhaps this is Miller's view of the contradictory nature of outlets like Fox News who praise our attacks on Iraq and Iran. They are famous for demonising them, yet many could argue that they merely counterattacked using the same means that we did to provoke them. Whether intentional or not, it certainly adds an interesting subtext to the plot, and it's great to see Miller provide balance to both sides of the argument instead of clearly choosing one as he has been guilty of in the past. One of the hilarious aspects about the Kandorian attack is that throughout we see humans not even looking up from their phone to witness the devastation around them. It adds volume to the work and cements the need for Batman. As a race we have become apathetic to most things due to our constant fixation on our technology. Please don't leave this review though and turn off your phone. News anchors comment on the destruction but they merely report. People pass the decay but don't get involved. We are truly lost and Miller wants to enforce that without action nothing can ever be accomplished. It's only upon the destruction of the mobile satellites that people finally look up and take action. We are slaves. Zombies that require a constant hit of dopamine to feel happiness. It's clear the creative team want us to come off our phones and take notice of the world around us. I absolutely loved this aesthetic, and paradoxically it shows Miller still has a keen eye for the media and mentality of the people that he bases his books on. Holding the world to ransom, the Kandorians demand that Earth surrender and become their slaves. In a triumphant moment that rivals the Batman v Superman fight in The Dark Knight Strikes Again, Bruce returns in the cape and cowl and tells them to go to hell. It really packs a punch and lets you know there's some life in the old guy yet. 
Superman returns and we really feel like we have our A-team back as we join them as they head into battle. Issues 2 and 3 certainly pick up the pace after a slow start from the former. Introducing the book's villains, they perfectly demonstrate the mind state that many people have towards certain sects of society. These chapters definitely get better the more times they are read, and as a collection act brilliantly at setting up the showdown between the world's finest and the Kandorians. We join Lara, the daughter of Superman and Wonder Woman, as she sides with the Kandorians in an affront to her father. Refusing to fight back, Superman takes a beating. Finding Superman guilty of lying to the people of Earth due to the fact that he presented himself as the last Kryptonian when Kandor exists, they cover him in dark matter and burn him in a collective laser eye blast. After this, the Kandorians deliver Earth with an ultimatum. Give us Batman or we will destroy the planet. The people of Earth, afraid of the alternative outcome, demand Batman surrender. Like an animal caught in a trap, they self-mutilate. Riots envelope Gotham. Fear driving them to destroy everything in sight to draw the Dark Knight out. They are truly lost. Throughout the narrative, it is highlighted that Superman is one of the people. The Kandorians despise this fact and view it as a weakness. Perhaps it is. Superman was always more Clark than the Man of Steel, and for better or for worse, he was one of us. Weak and pacifist, he is a shell of the man he used to be. He symbolises the apathy of the people. Batman, however, demonstrates that they need powerful symbols to shake them out of it, and I believe that Superman's return to the battle upon the re-emergence of the Cape Crusader signifies the shift in the people's attitude to taking things lying down. Riding back into town, the Dark Knight returns. Playing heavily upon nostalgia, he is equipped with the Batmobile and armor suit from the prior entries. Ready to tackle the problem head on, he rides for war. It's brilliant to see Bruce back in the saddle in what is arguably one of the most iconic suits that he has ever worn. It's a truly triumphant moment that elevates the book and definitely stands and strong as one of its high points. Lacing the clouds with kryptonite rain, Batman cunningly disarms the Kandorians of their powers and with help from Clark, he wails on them. Unfortunately, it's during this period in the book that the mini-comics fall to their lowest point. We get an absolutely dismal Carrie Kelly story and a Lara one that has a worse love scene than the Dark Knight Strikes Again. We see Baal and Lara romantically flying through the sky whilst lovemaking and the flashes of the Wonder Woman Superman scene are enough to induce nausea. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's the worst part of the entire book. Poor in art and pacing, they really feel like phone-ins. At this point the gimmick had to be sustained no matter what and due to this the inclusions feel forced. I would much rather have focused on the main battle instead of having to divert from it with these side stories and the book becomes a better read if these are skipped. Clashing between a stellar main plot and a far inferior sub one, the middle section of the book seems to really struggle with delivering on its potential. There's a lot of great work here, but it's juxtaposed completely by the substandard side stories that feel like pointless diversions. It's brilliant seeing Superman and Batman fighting side by side once more. Feeling like the arc and animosity between the two has come full circle, the world's finest stand out on every page that they grace. The Kandorians don't take it lying down, and watching the battle between human and superhuman is a thrilling one that packs the book's first real punch. Staying true to its roots by remaining comic-y, there's a feeling of joy on every panel throughout the battle. Seeing Carrie almost kill Baal with a kryptonite rock in a slingshot could be viewed as slightly twee, but it works to great effect and feels true to the character's origins. The narrative doesn't end with this battle though, and the Kandorians that flee cement themselves as poor losers by shooting Batman in the back with a heat vision laser. This sends him into a flatline. Standing firm is a brilliant battle, the midsection fight certainly delivers upon all of the setup thus far. Whilst relying heavily on fan service, it still delivers on some unique moments that add true characteristic to this book. It's gut wrenching to see Batman take a fall at issue 6's climax, and this speaks volumes as to just how invested I was in the characters at this point. It was the first time since reading the original Dark Knight Returns book that I felt DC were back on track with their Frank Miller universe, and this is one of the highs of the saga. It's also in this section that the mini issues begin to pick up. 
We see Lara battle Wonder Woman and the book is laced with regret on the latter's part that really adds weight to the fight. Realising that Lara was raised wrong, it's up to Wonder Woman to put her in line. Relatable on a parent versus child level, I'm sure every reader can think back to a point in their life when they waged war against their mother or father and were put back in their place. It adds a subtext that was missing from the earlier mini comics and feels like a huge upswing in comparison. In the aftermath of the fight we see some hilarious news coverage on the event. Donald Trump states that we won just like I said we would and now we'll make the Kryptonians pay to rebuild Gotham City. You're gonna love it. And the book feels like a sophisticated look at modern day media. Images are splashed across iPhone screens and it adds weight to the fact that nowadays, for better or worse, everything is filmed. This is, this is Once again this hammers home the point that everyone is now connected and we can either work as a cohesive unit or choose not to. Either way it paints the picture that we as a race have the opportunity to strive or fall by the wayside. It was during this point that I was stuck with the realisation that perhaps the master race pronoun used in the title isn't referring to the Kandorians, it's us. Filled with racial connotations, it pinpoints a human outlook on other civilizations. We often view ourselves as above others and lash out with violence at signs of weakness. We take what we can in order to further our own means and this causes us to neglect the good of others for our own goals. This motif is laced throughout the book and reassured me that Miller and Azarello were putting depth into the work that would be missed by many readers. Seeming like a mere action comic, this subtext behind the story has a wealth of work to look into and analyse and I urge readers to reread the work to see what they missed the first time. One of the most controversial aspects of the book is the rejuvenization of Bruce Wayne. Placed in the Lazarus pit upon his demise, the hero returns reborn, a young man once more. Whilst many scoff at the idea of Bruce ever using the pit, I see it as a get out of jail free card that allows Batman to exist in every era. In real life the Cape Crusader probably would seek out the Fountain of Youth in order to continue his war on crime, and similar to Raish he requires it in order to complete his never ending mission. Dissimilar to Raish, Bruce is a good man at heart and he would only use it to have a positive aspect instead of blaming it for driving him insane. Even if he scoffs at Clark for reviving him with it, it still gives him an opportunity to carry forth the wisdom he gained with old age and place it in the body of a young man. The Dark Knight has truly returned. This section of the book really improved the quality of the story and at parts it felt as good as the original source material. I was left open mouthed several times and it delivered on the punches both physically and metaphorically. Launching an attack on the Amazonians, the latter part of the book feels like a beautiful depiction of war. It's thrilling to see Wonder Woman rise to the forefront of this saga after being solidly planted in the background. The face-off is glorious and it's a triumphant moment that works as a standalone issue and as part of the collection. Following this is the spectacular mini issue which centres around Commissioner Yindel taking down Bruno and the rest of the remaining Joker gang. It's very, very goddamn Frank Miller, but there's a lot to like here. Playing heavily on nostalgia, it's a nice touch to see Bruno return, swastika nipples and all. Especially when I didn't think the character would ever make a reappearance. During the gunfight, we get Batman's return, and the issue ends on him making a tough choice, saving Yindel or the city. The commissioner makes it easy for him, and it's nice to see that the character stays true to her roots, even choosing duty over death. Whether she dies or not is unclear, but it's a well-deserved send-off to one of the saga's most controversial characters. In a fittingly old-school Batmobile, the Cape Crusader races to face the Kandorians head-on. Using bats, he disorientates the supermen and causes them to fire upon each other. It speaks volumes as to how much of a strategical man that Bruce remains and how fear and panic have always been his greatest allies. In the turmoil, the Kandorians disband and the deserters are murdered. It's brilliant that whilst he cannot overpower them, using psychology, Batman can still destroy them in other ways. Superman races to take down the remainders and we come to the realisation that the Boy Scout has in fact been holding back all these years. Merely a pacifist in the past, he unleashes all of the power that he had to begin with. Joined by Lara and the Atom, who had merely been stuck in Basil's shoe at an atomic level, the superhumans return. It's an outstanding face-off that allows Superman and Lara to once again become the heroes. They've had a bad rap throughout this saga, 
playing the villain for the majority of it, but it's great to see that even Miller understands that at heart, the Man of Steel and his kin are the best of us. Ending on Bruce and Carrie journeying off into the night and Clark teaching Lara the joy of humanity, it struck me that this isn't a book about the return of the Dark Knight. It's about family. Bruce with no heirs had to create one by inspiring others. Clark has neglected his daughter and in some ways is responsible for her actions. Instead of going out on a big bang, the book decides to instead end sentimentally. It's an inspired choice. After all, this is about passing on one's knowledge to the next generation. That to me is what Batman and Superman now represent. Wise old men who wish to no longer see those who follow make the same mistakes. I absolutely adore this ending and it marks a fitting end for Batman. I'm happy to say that Batman The Dark Knight Returns The Master Race is a great book. Whilst it features slightly lacklustre issues, as a complete collection it works brilliantly. If you read this issue by issue and were disappointed by the seemingly never ending setup and poor pacing, I urge you to go back and read this collection. Some of it feels like fan fiction, some of the writing is worse than the movie scripts Gerard Butler gets sent but some of it is Frank Miller at his best. Standing head and shoulders above the Dark Knight Strikes again, this feels like a fitting return to the saga, and as many moments that rival the original book. Sure, sometimes it feels a bit by the numbers. Sure, this is a lot broader than the original work. Sure, it feels like PG-13 Miller, but reigning in the creator has provided a lot of positives. I had a great time with the arc, and I'm greatly looking forward to a return visit. This is a good book good enough, and that's why it gets an 8 out of 10. I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. The upsurge in traffic that I've seen on my channel has made a huge difference to my creative process, and I've greatly enjoyed reading the, all of the Dark Knight Returns books in the build up to this. I did actually have the entire video filmed, but I went back and re-edited it because I just felt it wasn't very professional with the, the mic I was using and the camera. So I just wanted to put my all into it. So I'd massively appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel and click the thumbs up button because it greatly helps me, even though I know this was delayed more than the original Master Race book. If you like this, make sure you check out my podcast, Watching the Watchmen, that I do with Tom Quee. Each month we analyse the Watchmen graphic novel issue by issue to see what kind of things it deals with thematically and it's a great journey through the entire graphic novel run. Again, thank you very much for checking this out. I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.